Thank you for joining us on Synthesis Workshop. On today's Research Spotlight episode, we're joined by Dr. Tyler Pabst. Tyler earned his bachelor's degree at Youngstown State University, where he did undergraduate research in the group of Professor Doug Genna. He subsequently came to Princeton to pursue his doctoral work in the Chirik group, and in May 2022, he completed his PhD there. He's currently working as a postdoc at UC Berkeley in the group of Professor Polly Arnold. And with that, I'll hand it over to you, Tyler. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you, Matt, for the introduction and for the kind invitation to present. My research in the Turek group revolved around the theme of selectivity and CH activation. Carbon-hydrogen bonds are so common in organic molecules that we've developed a convention of just not drawing them most of the time. It's this ubiquity of CH bonds that gives rise to the great opportunity and challenge associated with their functionalization. If we can develop systems which exploit the subtle differences between a molecule's CH bonds, then we've got an efficient way of building up and diversifying compounds for all kinds of applications in agrochemicals, materials, and pharmaceuticals. Selectivity is crucial because aselective reactions give us product mixtures, which we have to expend time and energy to separate and often result in generation of byproducts that aren't useful to us and are simply disposed of as waste. Factors such as CH bond strengths and steric environments can affect a catalyst preference for activation of a given site over all the others. The existing functionality on the organic substrate can introduce additional biases, whether it's by coordinating to a metal catalyst and directing CH activation at a particular site, or by participating in competing chemical reactions. Among the most common CH functionalization reactions is CH borylation, where an organic substrate is treated with a boron reagent, most typically B2-PIN2, in the presence of a metal catalyst. This generates a synthetically versatile organoboronate, which can then be used to generate linkages between that carbon atom and many other common functional groups. A stoichiometric borane byproduct is also generated, in this case it's HB-PIN. By far the most commonly used and well understood catalysts are formed from the combination of a bipyridine ligand and an iridium-1 precursor. This iridium catalysis was developed independently by the groups of John Hartwig and Mitch Smith and continues to influence the design of CH borylation catalysts to this day. Because regioselectivity is paramount in CH functionalization, I want to discuss how the established iridium catalysts discriminate between arine CH bonds. A general trend is that the barrier to CH functionalization is really high for CH bonds ortho to most functional groups due to sterics. For example, borylation of metaxylene exclusively gives the 135 trisubstituted product because all positions ortho to methyl groups are blocked. And this is great, but problems start to arise when multiple different types of CH bonds are present. In the case of toluene, the ortho CH bonds are blocked, but the meta and para CH bonds are functionalized indiscriminately to give a statistical mixture of the aryl boronate products. A natural question to ask is whether these catalysts can distinguish between electronically differentiated CH bonds in similar steric environments. And this question is especially relevant due to the prevalence of fluorinated arenes in small molecule pharmaceuticals. Fluorine is often incorporated into drug molecules to affect the drug's membrane solubility and its metabolism. However, fluorine is small and doesn't coordinate very strongly to transition metals in most cases, so conventional steric and directing group approaches are not typically useful for CH borylation of fluoroarenes. Using typical BIPI iridium catalysts, borylation of this substrate, which is two sterically accessible but electronically distinct CH bonds, gives modest selectivity favoring functionalization meta to the fluorine in a 60-40 ratio. And I want to be clear that it's not my intention to be critical of iridium catalysis. These catalysts are amazing and they're very useful for many applications, but this is one application for which different systems might be needed. One catalyst which appears better suited to this application is the PNP cobalt system developed in the Chiric group by former graduate student Jennifer Obligacion. And these catalysts have been demonstrated to borelate the same substrate with 95 to 5 selectivity favoring the ortho position. This unique ortho regioselectivity proved to be quite general among fluorinated arenes, and it motivated a detailed mechanistic study to understand its origins. And in order to focus on more recent work and to keep this presentation somewhat contained, I'm going to skip ahead to the conclusions of this mechanism study, which was carried out by Jenny, Etienne Rochette, and myself. If you're interested in the details, I encourage you to check out the reference near the top of this slide. A combination of kinetic studies, kinetic isotope effects, isotopic labeling, and resting state analysis culminated in this proposed mechanism. First, the dihydride boryl precatalyst reductively eliminates H2 to generate a cobalt-1 boryl. This can't occur directly in one step because the hydrides are trans to one another. This is instead a stepwise process that has been studied computationally, and I've abbreviated as one step in the interest of space here. The resulting cobalt-1 boryl species then undergoes a fast and reversible CH oxidative addition to generate a cobalt-3 intermediate bearing aryl, hydride, and boryl ligands. Note that the aryl and boryl ligands are trans to one another, so they can't directly reductively eliminate the expected aryl boronate product. 
Instead, HB pin is reductively eliminated to afford a cobalt-1 aryl intermediate, which is observed as the resting state in the reaction when monitored by fluorine and phosphorus NMR. It's important to note that we only observe the orthofluorinated isomer of this complex, and independent syntheses of both isomers allowed unambiguous assignment of the ortho in our in-situ studies. HB pin then undergoes oxidative addition with the cobalt-1 aryl to generate a cobalt-3 intermediate with mutually cis aryl and boral ligands, which can then reductively eliminate the aryl boronate product. This also affords a cobalt-1 hydride, which can then regenerate the cobalt-1 boryl species by reaction with either HB pin or B2 pin 2. So this mechanism is consistent with our observables, but one question that we haven't addressed yet is, why would this reversible CH oxidative addition result in ortho to fluorine selectivity? To answer that question, we invoke a known phenomenon which has been referred to as the orthofluorine effect. This is the observation that orthofluorine substituents stabilize metal aryl complexes. In a seminal study by Jones and Perutz, a CP rhodium complex was heated to 67 degrees Celsius and metadifluorobenzene for four hours, and this gave a 5 to 1 ratio of the products shown here. Under these conditions, they didn't observe any of the other possible regioisomer which could arise from CH activation between the two fluorines. However, when they heat this complex to 78 Celsius for 20 hours, they observed that product exclusively. This is to say that the thermodynamic product of CH activation is the one which maximizes the number of orthofluorine substituents. In the time since this report, the orthofluorine effect has been studied computationally, most prominently by Odile Eisenstein and coworkers and tools have been developed which allow us to quantify it for a given complex. If we consider a series of free aryns, an increase in the CHBDE is observed with the addition of each orthofluorine substituent. When we calculate the metal carbon BDEs for the corresponding series of transition metal aryl complexes, an analogous metal carbon bond strengthening effect is observed, but in this case, the magnitude of the effect is much greater than in the free arene. We can visualize this with a plot of the relative bond energies of the metal carbon bond on the y-axis and the relative CHBDEs of the free arene on the x-axis. Because the bond strengthening effect in the metal complex is greater than that in the free arene, the plot has a slope significantly greater than 1. We'll call this slope, which is 2.43 in the example shown, RMCCH, and it serves as a reporter of the magnitude of the orthofluorine effect. Steeper slopes, and in turn higher RMCCH values, signal that a complex is more sensitive to aryl electronics. Hypothetically, an RMCCH equal to 1 would indicate that the orthofluorine effect is not operative, and a value less than 1 would suggest that it is inverted. Our calculations for PNP cobalt complexes like those shown here returned an RMCCH value of 2.87, indicating that the orthofluorine effect is operative for this system. And so it is a combination of a fast and reversible CH oxidative addition and the thermodynamic preference for orthofluoroaryl intermediates, which results in the orthoselectivity in PNP cobalt catalyzed fluoroarene borylation. With that in mind, we were curious whether this mechanism and resulting selectivity would be conserved as we changed the arene substrate. This led to a follow up study where I was joined by Linda Kwa and Caitlin McMillan, and where we found the PNP cobalt catalyst to be surprisingly sensitive to the arene's electronics. Borylation of an aryl boronate bearing one fluorine and one trifluoromethyl group resulted primarily in functionalization ortho to the fluorine substituent, and the kinetics and KIE data supported a fast and reversible CH oxidative addition, as in the mechanism I just showed you a few slides ago. But something really interesting happened when we replaced the trifluoromethyl substituent with a less electron withdrawing fluorine. Here, we instead observe a preference for borylation at the position para to the boron group and meta to both fluorines. Kinetics and KIE supported a turnover limiting CH oxidative addition in this case, suggesting that the different selectivity can be attributed to a different mechanism, or at least a difference in the relative rates of the fundamental reaction steps. It appeared that by changing the substrate, the rate of CH oxidative addition slowed to the point that it became turnover limiting, resulting in a different selectivity under kinetic rather than thermodynamic control. We were fascinated by this observation of substrate controlled selectivity, and it clued us into something that might be substantially more useful and that's catalyst-controlled radioselectivity. Could we design a different catalyst which would borrelate the same substrates as PNP cobalt, but by a mechanism in which CH activation is slow, thereby inverting the radioselectivity? This would be impactful since metaselectivity and CH functionalization is typically achieved using cleverly engineered directing groups or steric environments, approaches which don't translate well to fluoroarenes because of the small size and poor coordinating ability of fluorine. An illustrative example is the recent work of Lorian Ilias and coworkers, where steric bulk is placed above and below the plane of a bipyridine ligand such that CH bonds para to a functional group are prevented from approaching the metal, thereby favoring metaborylation. This method works quite well for large substituents like tert-butyl, 
but it makes a mixture of products when you try to selectively borylate fluorobenzene. We wondered whether we could slow CH activation by moving from the relatively strong electron donor, PNP, to a weaker electron donor such as terpyridine. And we looked to terpy because a previous graduate student in the Chirik group, Nadia Leonard, had already developed these catalysts for toluene borylation. We began by screening catalysts and conditions for the borylation of the fluorinated sulfonamide substrate shown here. First, using the cobalt-2 bisacetate precatalyst which was developed by Nadia, a 23% conversion of borylated products was obtained with an encouraging 82 to 18 selectivity in favor of the meta product. Because the activation mechanism of the cobalt-2 carboxylate is not well understood, we switched to a better defined cobalt-1 alkyl and also lowered the temperature to rim temp. This gave a diminished conversion of 14% but improved the selectivity to 92 to 8. Use of the more electron donating tristert butyl terpy ligand improved the activity and we got a 42% conversion in this case. Unfortunately, changing other reaction conditions did not significantly improve the reactivity. So we took a break from screening and we turned to stoichiometric chemistry in an attempt to improve our understanding of catalyst speciation. In previous studies of catalytic CH borylation, metal borils have been observed and isolated, and these have provided information on catalyst speciation in resting states. Borils of PNP cobalt have been prepared by straightforward addition of B2PIN2 to the cobalt 1 alkyl. Attempting the same reaction with a terpy cobalt complex was not as straightforward, and instead gave an intractable mixture of products. We were able to gain some insight by growing single crystals from this reaction mixture. And by single crystal x-ray diffraction, we observed a trimetallic cobalt complex featuring three terpy ligands. And I want to note that the one drawn on the bottom here is CH activated at the position next to a purity nitrogen. And I want to be clear that we don't know to what extent this species is formed in catalysis, but after we became aware of the possibility, we were invested in trying to shut it down to see if we could improve our turnover numbers. Because this unusual trimetallic species seems to arise due to ligand CH functionalization, we decided to pursue a catalyst without any sterically exposed CSP2H bonds. Thankfully, terpyridine ligand syntheses are quite modular, and we prepared our target ligand in short order by synthesis of a methylated acetylpyridine, followed by condensation with a benzaldehyde in the presence of aqueous ammonia. Starting from inexpensive, commercially available starting materials, you can make grams of this very flocculent yellow solid in the space of an afternoon. Metallation with cobalt-2 chloride and alkylation were straightforward to give us the cobalt-1 neosilo complex we were after, and here we see its solid state structure determined by x-ray diffraction, which should give you a better idea of its steric profile. When we tried using the sterically protected complex as a precatalyst, we observed a substantial increase in conversion to 81%. We were also pleasantly surprised to find that the regioselectivity improved to 98 to 2. These proved to be optimal conditions, and I want to note that increasing the temperature did us no favors, as running the reaction at 50C decreased the conversion to 56%. I don't want to spend too much time on scopes, so I'll share a quick sampling. The method generally acquires electron-deficient substrates, but allows for the preparation of 135 trisubstituted aryl boronates with high regioselectivity, as those shown here. Meta-difluorinated substrates also underwent selective borylation, as did two fluoropyridines. And one interesting trend is that when substrates that have sterically accessible CH bonds, ortho, meta, and para to fluorine, were subjected to the reaction conditions, the meta is still the major product, but the only detectable minor product is that arising from borylation of the para position. This stands in contrast to the PNP cobalt catalysis, where the general selectivity trend is ortho over meta over para. At this point, we had successfully developed a meta to fluorine selective reaction, but we were really interested in understanding why. Specifically, were we observing meta-selectivity because the CH activation event had slowed to the point of being rate-determining? And a definitive answer to that question can be obtained from deuterium kinetic isotope effects. Using the natural abundance sulfonamide and its deuterated analog, we observed KAEs of approximately 3 in both parallel and competition experiments, indicating that the CH bond is broken in the turnover-limiting step. Since this step is turnover-limiting, it must be irreversible, and given that this is a CH functionalization reaction, this result provides support that the CH activation event is regioselectivity determining. Next, we were interested in the nature of the CH activating intermediate. Dissolving the cobalt-1 alkyl precatalyst in a relatively electron-deficient fluoroarene resulted in no reaction upon heating or stirring. The solution was to run the same experiment under a whiff of hydrogen gas to generate a cobalt-1 hydride, which was expected to be a more potent CH activating complex than the alkyl. We proposed that this cobalt hydride undergoes reversible CH oxidative addition with the fluoroarene, resulting in the orthofluoroaryl complex under thermodynamic control. Notably, catalytic borylation of this arine substrate gave extremely high meta to fluorine regioselectivity. So this result suggests that the cobalt hydride is not a significant CH activating species during catalysis. While we haven't directly observed a terpy cobalt-1 boril, this seems to be the most reasonable candidate for the CH activating species, given that the alkyl is unreactive and the hydride gives orthogonal regioselectivity. 
Since we had an orthofluoroaryl complex in hand, we wanted to know whether the CB bond formation event favors borrelation of the metaposition through some kind of isomerization following formation of the metal carbon bond. Addition of HP pin to the aryl complex affords exclusively the product you would expect in the absence of such an isomerization. A parafluoroaryl cobalt complex of the trist terpedo ligand was prepared by Grignard addition. An addition of HB pin to this compound gave a similar result as the one above, further supporting that the initial formation of the metal carbon bond sets the regioselectivity of the catalytic borrelation. One last line of questioning that remained was whether terpy cobalt complexes represent some sort of special case where the orthofluorine effect doesn't apply. To assess that possibility, we generated a bond association free energy correlation diagram in the convention of Eisenstein and Perutz and obtained an RMCCH of 2.47, suggesting that the thermodynamics of CH activation should favor the ortho site for these terpy cobalt complexes. To ask the question a little bit more directly, we also calculated the ground state energies of the ortho, meta, and para isomers of a terpy cobalt fluoroaryl complex. According to the calculations, the ortho isomer was thermodynamically preferred. The meta and para isomers were 3.4 and 5.2 kcals per mole higher in energy, respectively, further supporting that if cobalt aryl thermodynamics predominated in determining the selectivity of these reactions, we would expect to see orthodofluorine selectivity in catalysis. To summarize the mechanistic results, deuterium kinetic isotope effects support a turnover limiting and selectivity determining CH activation event, and stoichiometric studies disfavor an isomerization event following cobalt carbon bond formation. Finally, Analysis of the relevant bond thermodynamics suggests that the thermodynamic control would result in orthodofluorine selectivity, offering additional circumstantial evidence that the observed metaselectivity is kinetic in origin rather than thermodynamic. Overall, I hope I've communicated some of the nuances and advantages of these cobalt catalysts for CH borrelation. We have found that they engage in diverse mechanisms that can result in unique selectivity outcomes, which in some cases complement what is possible with precious metal catalysts and motivates further development of earth abundant metal borrelation catalysts. Of course, nothing I've shared today would have been possible without Paul and the rest of the amazing people and scientists who I had the privilege of working with during my PhD. If you enjoy this presentation, I encourage you to keep up with the research of the chair group, who are always putting out really exciting organometallic chemistry and catalysis. Thanks to Princeton, Amgen, and the NIH for funding, and thanks again to Matt for inviting me to speak and for organizing the Synthesis Workshop series. Finally, thank you for watching and for making it to the end. Thank you for tuning in for this Research Spotlight episode, and thank you to Tyler for sharing your work with us. If you enjoyed the episode, you can support us by subscribing and telling your peers about this podcast, and feel free to send us any questions or comments you have. Follow us on Twitter to stay up to date, and see you all next time.